Have you ever been subjected to a sermon that was vulgar or perverse or just plain unbiblical? Chances are that sermon was an example of really bad spiritualizing. Today's episode is about the chapter titled on spiritualizing in Spurgeon's book, Lectures to My Students. There are many areas of preaching that require balance, the avoiding of extremes, and spiritualizing is one of these areas. What is spiritualizing? That's a good question. Well, the simplest answer is, spiritualizing is putting a spiritual truth to something. A more elaborate answer would be that spiritualizing is taking a story or a verse or a passage from the Bible and using those stories or verses of a passage uh, in a sermon to illustrate or to allegorize a theological truth. There is a good way to spiritualize and there is a bad way to spiritualize. And the truth is that spiritualizing verses in the Bible, uh, if not done carefully, can lead to really, really bad preaching. Now, there are two ends to this spectrum, or perhaps I should say there are two ditches on either side of this road called spiritualizing. On the one side, uh, the one ditch on one side is the fastidious Adam Clark whose commentary I like, but whose opinion on spiritualizing I disagree with. And Adam Clark said, allegorical preaching debases the taste and fetters the understanding both of preachers and hearers. On the other end of this spectrum or the other side of this road in the opposite ditch are preachers who, instead of not spiritualizing at all, abuse spiritualizing and take scriptures and shoehorn meanings into passages that are not intended to be there. And they make sermons stranglers of scripture texts. The balance here, I believe, is the path that Spurgeon held to. He said, within limit, my brethren, be not afraid to spiritualize. I counsel thee to employ spiritualizing within certain limits and boundaries. Do not drown yourselves because you are recommended to bathe. Let me share with you four guidelines that Spurgeon gives us in this chapter titled on spiritualizing. The first is this. Do not violently strain a text by illegitimate spiritualizing. Want an example? Spurgeon references Roland Hill's book, Village Dialogues, wherein Roland Hill describes a Mr. Slopdash who preached on uh, the dream of that Pharaoh's baker had, wherein he had three baskets on his head. I'm sure you remember that story from the Bible. Mr. Slopdash took that story and used it to preach on the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, if you don't see the problem with preaching on the doctrine of the Trinity, from the story of Pharaoh's baker, then you have no business spiritualizing. You're not ready for it. And you need to just stick to the plain sense of scripture. Spurgeon warns, ludicrous results sometimes arise from sheer stupidity inflated with conceit. Avoid that childish trifling and outrageous twisting of texts, which make you a wise man among fools but a fool among wise men. He then shares an example from William Huntington, who infamously preached uh, about the commandment where the Bible says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Huntington made it to mean that the Lord was speaking to Jesus and saying, thou shalt not covet the devil's wife, that is the non-elect. Spurgeon said of this, one can only say horrible. Number two, never spiritualize upon indelicate subjects. Of course, we should always avoid being vulgar in the pulpit, but Spurgeon emphasizes it here because there is a tendency among preachers of the slopdash variety 
to take adult-themed passages from Scripture and turn them into full-blown sermons that serve no other purpose than to crimson the cheek of the modest. These preachers mistake bodiness for boldness, and they conflate tawdry talk for plain preaching. Spurgeon warns of these types of preachers, saying, There is a kind of beetle that breeds in filth, and this creature has its prototype among men. So don't be a dirty preacher, and don't take liberties with delicate passages. Perhaps just leave those alone. Spurgeon emphasized the preacher's duty to keep his sermon appropriate by saying, No pure mind ought to be subjected to the slightest indelicacy from the pulpit. Number three, as Spurgeon put it, never spiritualize for the sake of showing what an uncommonly clever fellow you are. The word of God plainly preached is the food that God's people need from the pulpit. But some preachers fall prey to the temptation to be novel and ingenious with the Bible, and it's just not necessary. The Bible is a treasure trove of truth. It is a veritable buffet of spiritual food. It is not necessary for preachers to be overly clever to find things to preach about to help God's people. Spiritualizing for the sake of appearing to be really clever is a really easy way to make yourself look like an idiot. So be careful when you spiritualize. Number four, in no case allow your audience to forget that the narratives which you spiritualize are facts and not mere myths or parables. Spurgeon explains, the first sense of the passage must never be drowned in the outflow of your imagination. It must be distinctly declared and allowed to hold the first rank. Your accommodation of it must never thrust out the original and native meaning or even push it into the background. You see, therein lies the problem of bad spiritualization. It completely divorces the sermon from the sense of the passage. In bad spiritualizing, there is no drawing of legitimate parallels. There is no suggestion of biblical types. There is no uh, illustrating with credible and appropriate anti-types. There's just really bad eisegesis. As bad as spiritualizing can be, Spurgeon does affirm that there is a legitimate range for spiritualizing. For example, the Bible is replete with types that are beautiful illustrations of the Savior's redemptive work. The temple, for instance, and, and the temple furniture and the Levitical sacrifices, all of those things are wonderful symbols and illustrations of Christ's work and God's plan of redemption. The New Testament affirms this. Along with the types, there are thousands of metaphors to be mined from Scripture. And there is a multitude of scriptural allegories that are ready for service in our sermons. Spurgeon elaborates on this saying, when the Apostle Paul finds a mystery in Melchizedek, and speaking of Hagar and Sarah says, which things are an allegory, he gives us a precedent for discovering scriptural allegories in other places. Indeed, the historical books not only yield us here and there an allegory, but seem as a whole to be arranged with a view to symbolic teaching. Now, if you want a good example of how to spiritualize well, Spurgeon humbly suggests that you read his devotional, morning by morning and evening by evening, and therein you'll find really great examples of what good spiritualizing is. One final source of passages available for spiritualizing are parables and miracles. Another word of caution here when it comes to parables, be sure to stick to the main lesson of the parable. Most parables of Scripture have one lesson that's trying to be conveyed, and don't spiritualize the parable to the point that that one lesson is lost in this convoluted spiritualization. So I encourage you to read this chapter in Spurgeon's book. He gives lots of examples of good and bad spiritualizing, and even an example of a good sermon that was founded upon bad spiritualization. So be sure to check out the links in the show's description. I close with Spurgeon's closing words. Guided by discretion and judgment, 
We may occasionally employ spiritualizing with good effect to our people. Certainly we shall interest them and keep them awake. And to that I say, Amen.